Knockback, the retro and nostalgia podcast, is brought to you by, well, you. If you want to learn how to support our show, go to patreon.com slash laststandmedia. Greetings and salutations. Welcome back to Knockback. My name is Colin Moriarty. I'm joined as always by my brother Dagan, Mr. Joshua Moriarty. Dagan, thank you for joining me today. How are you, my friend? You're getting too old for this shit. I know. When I heard it, I finally heard it. I was like, yes, there it is. There's the line. <laughs> There's the line I haven't heard in so long. There it is. Well, today's episode of Knockback, our retro and nostalgia podcast that I do with my brother each and every week is all about Lethal Weapon, the 1987 Mel Gibson, Danny Glover film. Very excited to talk about it. Classic buddy cop film, yeah. one of the quintessential ones. But of course, this podcast podcast goes up each and every week and you can support it over on Patreon, patreon.com slash last stand media you can watch the video version on youtube a week later with ads listen on podcast services like most of you do with ads but we appreciate your support over there you can submit your questions comments concerns thoughts and ideas and so on dig before we get into the topic as we usually do we like to stretch our legs a little bit i wonder what is on your mind stretch my short legs definitely yeah. i thought you were going to say something else for a minute or I think you're saying. <laughs> i was saving that one for next week stretch my short oh oh Another dice reference. Nice, yeah, dude. Yeah. I wasn't expecting that. Um, you always throw me off balance with this kind of stuff. That's why I love I'm, it. It's always an adventure. Yeah. Helene says I, I'm cursed with a long torso and short legs, which I never really, re- like I probably didn't realize this until my mid to late twenties when <laughs> she so kindly brought it to my attention. And it always makes me wonder what kind of skateboarding ability i could have had had i had long legs like my friend adam for instance growing up he was super talented so the short leg thing but here's my here's my thing that i wanted to talk to you about because this has been on my mind all morning Hmm. and this is something i've been kind of a dilemma been grappling with this for a while Hmm. and maybe you could speak to this in some way so and here and there's also a reason why this is kind of a little more um it's coming into play now a little more than usual. So I have this thing with work where if I'm designing characters, fine. If you guys don't know, I work in animation. If I'm storyboarding, usually fine. But when I'm actually animating, when I'm in the act of actually doing animation, animating scenes, animating whatever, even motion graphics, doesn't matter. It really tends to zap my energy at the end of the day. And all my creative juice is sort of drained, right? So I find when I actually animate, I don't have a lot of creative energy to give outside of work. I mean, it could get to the point where I can't even think of something fun to say on Twitter. It's like, I'm just completely zapped. I need to kind of reload. And usually that's that's fine. I could take a night good night rest, recalibrate, maybe it takes a couple of days or a weekend. And then I got my creative juices flowing. I can work on my own stuff. I just don't have it. Even to write something, I don't really have that creative energy to lend outside of animating for the day. And don't get me wrong. I love animating. I I really enjoy the act of animating. It's a passion of mine. And it could be very rewarding. You know, when you pull something off, do a scene, time it, sort of ideate, draw it out, make it work, illusion of life and all that kind of stuff. It could be very rewarding when you pull off an animation. It could also be devastating when it doesn't work out. But either way, it's a very emotional experience. And I just think it takes all of me to do that. You get into that space for an eight or 10 hour day. When you come out of it, you know, you're sort of kind of feeling your way and groping through life because now you're back in the real world and you're not inside of that 10 seconds you were just working on all day or whatever. And I love it. I really do. But it drains me. It just zaps me, right? Of my creative mojo. So right now, it sucks because I'm trying to work on this thing at night, this little project. Kyle, you know a little bit about it. Not too many people are aware I'm doing this, but I have this sort of personal project in the offing that now, don't get me wrong. I love being at Nickelodeon. I'll be there hopefully for a long time. Been there for a year already. But so I'm trying to do something on my own now, finally, after years of saying I'm going to do this. And basically what it's going to culminate as is a YouTube channel 
for animation. I'm going to do a podcast. I'm going to do a interview series with people in the animation industry, friends and otherwise, and do a very sort of warts and all take on experiences in the industry, what people have gone through, what people deal with. And that just doesn't exist in animation. Just sort of a very painted black, full on, um, I guess, not, you know, not, not something where people are going to get blackballed from the industry, but a very honest account of people's experiences working in animation and stuff like that. I think it'd be really interesting. Plus reviews, animation reviews and stuff like that. And then the, the, the meat of this whole channel is going to be this animated project that I've wanted to get off the ground for a long time. And I don't know how I'm going to crowdsource it and how I'm going to deal with all the, the financing and all that yet, but I'm in the process of writing these things and I just don't have it. I don't have the creative, um, I don't know what you want to say, I guess the creative energy to really put into it right now. The bandwidth. The I bandwidth. I don't, yeah. I just feel like the meter is completely all the way depleted, de- you know, diminished, depleted, and I don't have what it, you know, I don't have anything to give at the end of the day now that I'm animating so much at work. So is this, and I'm trying to f- figure out how to deal with that. Like, uh, I guess we would you want to call as a speedy or a cheated cliff notes, like recalibration where I could just kind of do it on the fly, like find a way to kind of center myself, get a little bit of that energy so I could apply it to other things in my life and not feel so zapped. You know, so is this, you don't, you're not an animator, but is this something that you're, but you're a very creative person. Is this something that you tend to wrestle with as well? Oh, or yeah. am I uh, on oh, my no, own totally, here? dude. No, no, yeah. you're not on your own. I mean, I can barely write anything at this point in my life <clears throat> that it has nothing to do with last stand. It's sad. Like I wrote the whole treatment for the new role playing game. And then I wrote like the beat to beat stuff, like the three acts of it and where things go. You meet this character here. It's you go work. here. This happens. You go here. This happens. Here are all the characters. Here's all that. But it's yeah. barely much of anything. Then I handed all of that off to to our mutual friend, Jono, sure. who is who is writing the actual script for the game. And six months ago, he was like, he handed me a script. He's like, all right, here's what. And I'm not really super worried about this from de- a development point of view, I should say. So I yeah. want to that up first. But he's like, here's the script. And this is what we're working off of. And I'm like, well, I'm going to change a lot of this stuff, but I have no energy to do this right now. And month by month by month by month by month, it just goes on. And I'm like, I can't. Like I'm getting to the point now where I'm like, I'm wondering if I really should just let this go and just be like, I created the world and it's just whatever it is it's going to be because like, which is a real shame because I am so excited for people to hear about what the game's about. And I'm like really proud of the whole it's structure great. of the game and who the good guys are and who the bad guys are and all this. I love it. It's very, it's going to be controversial. It's going to be really interesting. And I'm proud of that. But when I sit down and look at the script and I'm like, I, I literally just like, I'm like, uh, like, I just, I just don't want to do it. And then I just shut it off and I, I go on to the next thing. And I don't feel especially concerned about it for two reasons. Number one is we have another game in development that's going to come out before the role playing game. The role yeah. playing game's in development as well. But we have another game that we've long teased. We've codenamed Forest Guardian that will come out first. That's more. And I, I call that game Barry Bobble. So that should give you an idea of what that game <laughs> is going to be like. And then we have the role playing game which has a code name on all that kind of stuff. And I've, I've given it an official title, but we obviously won't say that for a long time. And since I laid out the structure of the game and it's being developed, it's going to look very much like an SNES role playing game. It's awesome. I see footage of it and music and all this shit all the time. Oh shit. The reality is, is the game can be entirely built with what I gave them. And I don't really have to do anything for a while. Like I really should be doing stuff, but I know in my mind, I'm like, I probably have a good year and a half until I really have to execute on this script. Okay. And So I write notes all the time and I like have all these ideas. And then it's because of what you're saying, dude, I, I record podcasts for, I don't know, 10 hours a week at least. Yeah. And the yeah. preparation for all those podcasts is immense. I mean, we're doing lost for instance, and that's, you know, a 10 hour commitment just in, in that when we do Metal Gear Solid 4, it's gonna be a 25 hour commitment. I have to stay. I, I try to explain this to, to the, our family too. And cause it, it's like, Imagine if you're I, to relate to Dana, for instance, our, our sister. Sure. She's an English teacher, a literature teacher. And sh- some books integrate themselves over time into your 
repertoire of books, but you're kind of going back and teaching the same things over and over again. Imagine if you were in a field where you have to continuously just absorb as much as possible. And the second you stop is the second you have no more credibility. It's an awesome point. And it's a great way to put it. I like one of the things that I put on the line is that I play more games than most people. And I'm not meaning games in volume, like how many games? I mean, like I play more hours of games than a lot of critics and people that do media do. I know more about them than most people. I've said before, I can really count on one hand the amount of people I know for a fact know more about video games than I do that cover them. And and in our field in PlayStation, I don't know anyone. And that requires a lot of work and a lot of energy. Of just, I'm not saying it's difficult necessarily. It's just a, it's a sacrifice. It is, as I always say, a lifestyle choice. Yes. And, and uh, playing 40, 50, 60 hours of games a week is that's a lifestyle choice. That's a, a above lot and beyond the fact that I run two companies. I'm the CEO of one company. I am the CCO of another company, and all that comes with that. Imagine when we got DMCA'd over the Tomb Raider leak. That took two days of my entire life to deal with that. A thousand dollars to the lawyers, all of these phone calls, this, that, and the other thing. Right. At, at some point, it's like I don't know what the fuck I'm supposed to do to get that energy, and so I totally relate to what you're saying because I put it all into the work. Yeah. And then my my spare time is spent making sure I'm prepared <laughs> for the work. <laughs> I could speak to that. You know. And Absolutely. Then, and so. When did I write the game? I wrote it over Christmas break when I had real time off. And I, I, I actually almost cried at the end of that break, to be perfectly honest with the audience, because I was like, we had 17 days. I remember 17 days to not record. And I was like, where I actually didn't take any time off. And now it's gone. It's There's flying no, out the window. It's gone. And, you know, it's like now it's January. Boom. Let's go. You know? And yeah. Yeah, dude. And now you're we're making in me August. realize there's so only so not, many hours in the day. It's not there's uncommon, only so much Dave. energy in the in the tank, right? Yeah, it's not uncommon. And here's the thing, because you no. know how I feel about this. One of the only the only time Dagan and I almost never fight or quarrel about anything or do no. even disagree about much, which some people get mad about. Not but all. I remember the one thing that I got mad about was that when you and I were talking about doing a podcast, another podcast together, which we ended up not doing. Right. And you told people about it because I hate that shit. And you know that I do where it's like I like being like here it is like that's my yeah, favorite right, thing in right, the world right. you know just dropping it right like here it is so you know now that you what you just explained you have to do it oh yeah you know? like, so you have to now. you have to figure it out i'm, I'm really excited because i feel like you might have something here yeah if I what you're so. saying is true and i think it probably is i don't know fucking anything about your field really at all but yeah if what you're saying is true that no one covers animation from that perspective there's no reason why you why your potential podcast couldn't be that product that makes its rounds in the various trenches of all of the different studios and all of that is some something relatable very much like joe rogan began as kind of a mmo bro podcast you know and then became yeah, something good much bigger. Point. So, so nonetheless i'm really excited to um to hear this and you broke colin's cardinal rules so <laughs> well you know it just apply it's so it's been frustrating because like like the hours in the day, I'm realizing, yeah, there's only so much energy you could pot one human being can possibly muster and apply towards said desire, right? But I have to also say, Kyle, just as a little aside, and this no no blowing smoke or anything, I've been catching up on sacred symbols. And I could see the amount of quality, the energy, the high level of sort of dedication. Um and and wherewithal and research and everything that you guys do and you you guys the three of you are well oiled machines it's not just the personalities and the banter but what you're discussing being articulate like I could really see sacred symbols improving and I think it was always great and so you know it makes me realize like yeah it you really can speak to what I'm saying because you're really pouring all of yourself all of your strength all of your dedication your energy. You, you could see that you're pouring it all into that project. You're giving all of yourself to something. And then it leaves you bare and a little barren mm -hmm. in other regards. So a lot of it's finding that balance. And I think a lot of it is going through those periods where you just know it's going to be that push up the hill. And you'll get to that point where you could get that light at the end of the tunnel where you're, it'll be a downhill ride for a little while. You and I do that around the holidays. Mm. And you do that with all the LSM shows where, you you know, you let's stack up some shows so we can take a little time off, for instance. Yeah. November is always the worst month for us because we try to just not do anything in December except for 
two episodes of Sacred Symbols will record. But otherwise, right. I try to give everyone a month off. I still pay everyone, obviously, but it's like it's important to find that time. But it's it's hard because I know you you I think it comes from dad and like just this innate workaholism. And I it's interesting because I don't think a lot of people really relate to it. I know some people can, but I think a lot of people can't. Like I always plus I'm trying to get another business off the ground, which I, I think some people have kind of put two and two together about what that might even be. And right. So like there's I just can't stop with that shit. And I like money. I like business. I like employing people. I like trying new ideas and satisfying an audience and all that's fun. So it's hard to kind of slow down and do the foundational creative work. And that's why I'm glad I found someone like Jono that understands what I'm trying to do with the games. And I still have to write right. Forest Guardian. That will be much easier. I can write Forest Guardian in probably a couple of days, just like I wrote the other games in a couple of days, basically. Like when I sit down and do something, I'm like, right, it's going to happen now. And, and it, right. it just it, it ha- I have like the dev kit next to me, the game up, and I just go through the entire thing and and pen it all. But I totally feel what you're saying. And it's um, it's incredibly difficult to to balance that. And I'm jealous of people that have that kind of creative energy, but I just don't have it. And um, I guess the thing with sacred symbols especially is. It's not like we're making wind turbines or doing something very technical and like also something no one would want to do or like it would be very difficult. It's like why there are no new car companies, really. It's like it's not it's not so much that people can or don't want to make cars. It's that it's really hard to make a car and and to manufacture it and all that. So it just doesn't happen in this sphere in PlayStation podcast, for instance, podcasting, for instance, it's very easy and accessible thing to do. So the only the only defense we have against competitors is to dare them to make a better show. That's like, it. I dare you to make a better PlayStation show than Sacred Symbols. You won't. You can't. And people try every week. And that requires energy. I'm not just showing up. I'm emailing people and sources. I, I always joke on the show. I like live my life on Moby Games, which is the amazing like <laughs> credit system for all of games. And I'm, I'm, lo- I'm looking things up on sources and I'm playing games and turning things on and watching a YouTube video or trying to find footage of something. And like, I don't you know, the, the show is eight, nine, 10 pages long and I have myriad notes and stuff. I try to go in prepared because I know that if I just rely on the fact that it's easy and that people are there, someone else is going to do it better. Sure. You have to put in the effort, you know, you have to. 110%. So, so you're yeah. not the 90% type. I work with animators like that and I love them. God bless them. And that's their, that's their sort of ethos. I'm going to give 90%. Or I'm going to give 80%. It doesn't have to be my best work. They're paying me, you know, it's nine to five, whatever type Mm -hmm. of thing. And God bless. You're finding balance. You're doing you. But that's not you. And that's not me. Like, you you know, you're just sort of, your mantra is to give everything and do and leave it out on the field, you know, 110% at all times. And I think that's where that energy zap really comes from because you're not leaving you know, we're only human, right? We're not demigods. We're not immortals or whatever. So it's like, you're only, you only have so much of that to give, then it's got, it's there, it's spent. And then you got to take the time to reload. Totally. And, yeah. and everyone has the agency to live their lives exactly how they want. It's like you said, like, I don't make personal judgments on people that want to have a life work balance or people that want to work to live. I totally understand that. But I'll argue that nothing was done that was great nine to five Monday through Friday. Like, do you think when John, what was that guy's Joni Ive or whatever, when he was designing the iPod at Apple, do you think that like the, the clock was like, it was like 2000, it, it was Thursday and it was five o'clock in Cupertino. He's like, I'm getting out of here. That's you know, what I'll be, back said, at, I'll be back at nine in the morning. I'll get right back to this iPod thing. It's like, no way. That guy probably fucking slaved over that thing for like a hundred hours a week. I'm not saying you have to live like that, but only great things only come from the furnace, like period. I agree. And, and, Absolutely. Uh, There's no chapter for those people that were great within those nine to five time constraints and another chapter for the truly great. No one's going to, you know, I always say that about animation. No one's going to say Dagan got this done super quick. They're going to say said animator did an, an amazing job. And that usually comes out of extra. Yeah. Right. Crunch extra work, extra rest. time, yeah. sacrificing other things, all that kind of thing. So thank you for indulging me in that conversation. No, totally. I, I'm, I totally understand what you're saying. I think it's very a very productive conversation to have because I, I get it. I feel lazy and inadequate sometimes. Again, writers always joke that they never write or a lot of writers just never <laughs> write. And I'm totally one of those writers. But it's um, it, a lot of it just comes from the fact that I don't I have a creative job. I've always had a creative job. So it's been difficult to be creative on the side because 
it's no disrespect to the accountant, no disrespect to the truck driver or whatever. But it's almost like if you do that kind of job, you are looking forward to what we are blessed to do for a living. Right. And so you have all of that. And as ironic as it sounds and strange as it sounds, we actually don't have the and thank I'm grateful, but we don't have the space of normalcy ever. I do whatever I want. Yeah. So it's like I, so it's it's just hard to break out of something to do something extra when you have something going in a nice flow. Sure. If you're good at what you do at work. It's hard to parlay that to the side, but you're going to have to find the extra energy and dig deep. But you'll do it. And then and then hopefully it'll become so big that you won't have to do the day job anymore. I mean, that's what happened with us. Right. And yeah, then, right. Yeah, exactly. That's its own sacrifice, because then I was never a game developer. That was the whole next level. Right. Of, of things. That's a new thing. So that's just like kind of funny required sacrifice after we were done with IGN. So too mm. does Lilimo require sacrifice after I'm done with Last Stand. Absolutely. You know, last, Same and, thing. Um, yeah, right. Yeah, you're right. I don't even get paid by I mean, I've said in the past, I don't get make any money from Lilimo. All of it, all of my money goes right back in. Right back in. Um, and pays everyone else basically. We would not be able to survive if because getting in being an indie developer is hard. If I was taking forty nine percent of the money instead of zero percent of the money, we wouldn't have any more games to put out. Right. So so that's the, the that's the sacrifice. So I'm actually putting in all this extra work and not even making any money. So in the hopes that one day we make that game that sells 50,000 copies or 100,000 I think you copies. will. You're going to get there, man. I really believe the role playing game is going to be that game. As I think so, it, too. As long as it gets a fair shake. I think um, so. Too, I think a lot of people sure. ignore our games, which sucks. But um, but yeah, anyway, so uh, well, good conversation. And since I contributed to that as well, we'll just leave it there. Absolutely. People, my friend. people like these long intros. Some people don't. <laughs> I don't really know what the hell any of you want from me at this point. All right, Dave, let's get to the topic at hand. All right. This was one that you actually wanted to do. In fact, you wanted to do the sequel to this film, Lethal Weapon. But I was like, we really should just do the first one first. I'm so and I hadn't seen did. it in a while. So, yeah, me too. So 1987 film, classic buddy cop film starring Mel Gibson, Danny Glover, and a pre mental impairment Gary Busey. <laughs> and no disrespect to that. I mean, I think Gary Busey's accident was in 89, something like that. This, so this is right before that. And you can right tell before. that he's normal here. That yes. he's not. He's not like the crazy Gary Busey. And we all love Gary Busey, of course. But so I was um, you know, two nice, brisk two hour film. I got it on Amazon, just downloaded it last night and, and watched it through. And it's a very enjoyable film. It's got a lot of violence, but it's makes sense within the grounding of the of the film it's it's pretty familial like i like how it shows the family side of being a police officer and the sacrifice there i think it's realistic in the sense that these people deal with real life issues that cast a pall over their professionalism or lack thereof it's actually a deeper and and darker movie than i remember it being because i think with lethal weapon 2 and especially with 3 it gets zanier and yeah. that's good. I love that shit. I mean, Lethal Weapon 2 is classic. That's considered the classic here. But it was cool to go back to the beginning and see this very 1980s. Pretty complex movie with a lot of interesting cinematography and that opening shot, for instance, with the helicopter going around L.A. and then zooming into the building. I think that's all practical, right? I think um, so. Yeah. And that's pretty cool. It's funny because, you know, that that shot was expensive and difficult to do and they kind of had to execute because the camera like really shifts and like zooms and moves at some point, And they kept it in because they probably only had one chance to do it. But it's a very, I don't know, a very cool movie. I'm glad I'm, I don't know why I never thought to do it. So I'm glad that you brought it up. Lethal weapon. What do you think? Dude, I have such a passion for this whole film franchise. And I really am glad you kind of nudged me to start at the beginning, even though a lot of this was like, let's just get to lethal weapon too, because I adore that film, especially, but yeah, it was so good to go back to 1987, watch this again a couple of times. And it just, it reminds me why this film and this franchise has endured the test of time because it's just a pure popcorn, fun film. It has the action, it delivers the thrills, the humor, the buddy cop thing, a little noir in there, little love letter to LA, especially an 80s flavored love letter to LA, which I love. And it has, it centers around two characters that you really dig and their, their sort of unlikely friendship and their escapades and their adventures. And it's as simple as that, low cost for entry. And I had really had to kind of dig down and remember 
I saw this film for the first time in 87. This is when my friends and I first started going to the movie theater. And I saw this in the theater. Uh, actually, Lethal Weapon 2 in the theater in 89. And then went back and discovered this movie via Lethal Weapon 2. So I had a sort of indirect journey, but fell in love with this one as well. And as you said, this one's a little bit... Uh, the tone is a little separated from the next two, three, and four in the franchise because it is a little darker. And it has a little more, just a little more of that gritty realism later on, a little sillier, a little more lighthearted. But this film is so great. And I, you know, I put Murtaugh and Riggs up there with the great buddy cops of all time. You know, you think of 21 Jump Street and 48 Hours and Rush Hour, and maybe you would put Men in Black into this category. And even more serious things like The French Connection and Sidney Poitier and Rod Steiger in in the heat of the night, things like that, Bert and Ernie, whatever. But th- these buddy, these two buddy cops, amazing. And also the most rewarding thing in just digging down and researching a little bit for the for the pod is that Mel Gibson is helming a Lethal Weapon Five. Even with the uh, our our loss of Richard Donner, Mel Gibson's going to helm it. He's going to direct and of course star. Hopefully, Danny Glover's in there. I know. Are we hopeful that? Mel Gibson and Danny Glover are both kind of poisoned now. I mean, Danny sure. Glover is like really left wing. I don't know if you've right. seen, you know that about him, like really off the reservation yes. left wing. And he's so a, a really he's kind of, a civil civil rights activist dating back. Yeah, and, I and think that's just like an apartheid activist. Like he's well, really look at the, been, the sticker on the on the fridge. Yeah, um, in the kitchen, I think is sure. very intentional. And that's totally cool. I don't, I'm not saying that I mind that, but. It's created, I think, a little bit of a barrier around using him more readily. And then Mel Gibson, of course, are, uh, that's what I wanted to kind of ask you about is, are we are we glad Mel Gibson has been rehabilitated? I think we talked a little bit about this in the Patriot episode. I have to say I am like. I know what he said and did. It's horrible, horrible. But I will also say that I guess I believe in redemption arcs. Sure. And it's so funny watching a film like this because this is a much younger much more inexperienced, much hungrier Mel Gibson and barely being able to hide his accent. In fact, I was telling, <laughs> yeah. telling Micah that I'm like, listen to him talk. And she's like, what are you talking about? I'm like, he's Australian because she didn't know that, you know? Sure. And yeah. you can tell, I mean, like it's barely hidden in this movie compared to his later performances and these amazing performances. But it's amazing to think that this movie is seven years away from Braveheart. Like, yeah, it's 13 years away from the Patriot. It's yeah, 15 years from signs. I mean, these really seminal moments in his career. And it's what I said to Michael when we were watching. I'm like, God damn, Mel Gibson is acting his heart out in this film, isn't he? So it was really nice to see this young Mel Gibson. What did you think about his performance specifically? Did you see that too? Like the scene with the gun in his mouth, the crying, the real tears, the when he's being held up like an act, he I was like, wow, I didn't know Mel Gibson had this kind of I don't really I don't think I ever realized Lethal Weapon had this kind of serious grounding chops. It always had the comedy and like the buddy cop funness. But I don't remember that. I, maybe because I was younger and I wasn't as sophisticated as in quotes as I am now. So what do you think about Mel Gibson in this film? I was re- misremembering that, too. Just the level of darkness that's in this film. I mean, it starts out with a a, a suicidal young porn star i mean it's like whoa like it get you know half naked and jumping from this build doing coke and jumping from the building but mel gibson yeah man i mean i could especially see looking back of course we had mad max and we had other things that he did in the 80s and he was becoming a movie star a proper icon but that level of energy that he commits i would put him up there i mean through the years and through the decades too not just starting in 87 or in the 80s i would put him up there with any of the great actors or actresses i mean he really has a range he has a very specific style an extremely high level of charisma and but just that energy the emotional range and something that he does in his performance and it's really on display here in lethal weapon is you know, he'll do something that's re- kind of an eccentric choice. He does a cartoony, very exaggerated take on things, very unique mm. and very odd. But somehow in that exaggeration and that cartooniness, there's a realism and a genuine believability in what he's doing. And I think because the choices are so authentic and I think he really feels it deep down. 
And it's not only is it entertaining and gratifying to watch, but you really get compelled and really get lost in what he's doing. And sometimes it's funny and sometimes it's heartbreaking. And sometimes there's a level of fury and a level of anger that just, I love that too. Like he's wrestling with demons in this, you know, he's haunted by the death of his wife only two or three years prior. And he's really, he's essentially suicidal. And, you know, you could see that angst and that fury and that anger and that sadness. And it's all like on display in his eyes. And it's, it, you think, I mean, you think of the Lethal Weapon franchise now, D- dating back, you know, over the course of a decade, but now it's been decades since we've had one. And you just think of the humor and you think of the lightheartedness and the action and the stunts and everything. But there's like, there's some emotional bearing in this too, which is really fun. And Mel Gibson's really at the center of that. And I, you know, I, you know, it, he, you know, he, we talk about people that were, you know, embroiled in controversy, Weinstein, right? Mm-hmm. Bill Cosby, mm-hmm. Michael Jackson. Mm-hmm. We already did the thriller, thriller album, and it's hard. But and Mel Gibson made some egregious mistakes. But there's something in there that it's cool to see that there could be uh, a societal level of forgiveness. There's something comforting in that for me. That people could just that, that like you said, there could be redemption, even when you make egregious mistakes like Mel Gibson did and said heinous shit and all that kind of stuff. It's nice that people could be welcomed back to the fold. And I'm sure there's a lot of conditional love for him right now because you're kind of waiting for the other shoe to drop with somebody like that or somebody who's capable of making such public gaffes. But I'm for one, I'm, I'm excited to see him back because I think he's a very talented actor and I think he's an equally as talented director. So it's nice to be able to have his art as long as he, you know, is, and I think there's a proper, there has to be for me. And I think this probably speaks to the way a lot of people feel. I think there has to be a very believable level of regret and sorrow and a sort of apologetic nature about being welcomed back into the into the fold, if you will. And I think, you know, I, for me, I think Mel Gibson did that. He also waited years and, that, you know, had to let t- a certain amount of time elapse before he was able to dip his toes back in the water. But for me, it's gratifying to see that people could forgive and you don't have to forget, but at least forgive and let people do what, you know, let people display their God-given talents. <laughs> Yeah, I, I think I think you're right. I, I also am glad to see his eye dart kind of oh, be in, in the. This in is the where it starts, well. I think, don't you? Yeah, yeah. I, I think because he's very much known as being Mad Max at this point, and I think this is a different sure. sort of role. And yeah, it's kind of the origins of the eye dart, I would say the the Mel Gibson eye dart, <laughs> which is you know one of the great moves in, in American acting history. So congratulations to him. But what about Danny Glover? What did you think about his performance? In this film, I find him very endearing. I, it's funny because I always think about him in Angels in the Outfield, which is a 1994 sure. film where he plays like the the manager of the Angels. And I, I really love that movie and I find him very endearing in that film. And that's always what I think about. But he obviously has a huge range of roles as, you know, many things beyond Murtaugh. So what do you think about his performance here? Yeah, he's got a he's got a real warmth and charisma, too. and. He's a great sort of side-by-side addition to Mel Gibson. They make a great team. I was looking at, did you look at Danny Glover's filmography? He's done a lot of movies that you've never heard of. Oh, yeah. It's actually infuriating. I was like going through and it would like, you know, be on 1986 and then you would scale and it would scroll really quick and it would land on 88. It was like, oh my God, like how many movies has this guy done? Not to mention television as well. And but you still think about him in those those iconic roles, the color purple, of course, leave the weapon franchise. I think of him as Henry Sherman in the Royal Tenenbaums. I love him mm-hmm. in that. Yeah, totally. But he's done a lot of apparently he's done a lot of foreign films and he's done a lot of stinkers or B movies, which is so interesting because he's so talented. I mean, I would put him up there with the iconic actors of the eighties and nineties. But I love him so much in this, and I love that he plays the part of this aging cop just turned 50 
He's he's a good cop. He's a good policeman, but he's a family man. He's enjoying the fruits of his labor now. He's got the house with the two car garage. He's got the fishing boat in the driveway. He's got the three point five kids and the beautiful wife. And it's not that he doesn't want to. He admits it. You know, he likes the he likes the easy answers. He likes the open and shut cases. He's not really down for. He's been on the force for twenty years. He's kind of on the downslope now of just riding it out to retirement. And here comes this younger sort of combustible dude that he's got to buddy up with and become, you know, this guy's partner. And it's going to, you know, there's all going to be all hell to pay now. And I love that pairing. It's that pairing, those two disparate personalities coming from two different walks of life, two different realities. And that friendship that blossoms despite that, it's kind of, it's just a lot of fun. And you see their love developing over the course of this film too, after especially Roger being so frustrated with Riggs in the beginning. So you get to see that that's what's so cool about this movie now that we have this four film franchise soon to be five is that you see the taking off point. You see where it all starts in this film. And that's, you know, that's what makes it special out of, you know, all four movies that we have so far is that you could see the origins. Totally. I, I am. Um... I don't know much about the casting of the film, but I, I just feel like this was this is very well done. I do wonder, of course, in a in an alternate universe where we wouldn't even have known this combination necessarily what it would have been and if we would have taken to the if it would have even become a series, but if we would have taken to it as we did. So I wanted to ask a little bit about something that I think you would like about this film that I know I was really intrigued by, which again I didn't remember at all from being a kid, which was the whole Vietnam War angle. Pretty interesting. We're about we're less than 15 years away from the end of the war in this movie. And it's fun to think about. I mean, it's horrible, of course, but it's fun to think about the interaction that various people in that society would have had with that war having been younger. I mean, now Vietnam vets are older. And um, so I really dig that these people have different interactions with such a horrible conflict, but that there's this whole CIA plot to run drugs and there's all these mysterious people that, you know, are being held kind of blackmail to work on this behalf. And it's just an incredible amount of money and it's this unstoppable machine. I really dig that whole very 1980s conspiracy angle. What did you think about that thread, which I didn't remember about this film at all? Yeah, I didn't remember that either. And I didn't remember uh, Martin Riggs sort of, I didn't really realize, you know, you don't re later when you get older in life and actual life, you realize a lot of policemen have military backgrounds. They mostly come from that world. And that makes sense. That extension of military to being a lifelong per, you know, in criminal justice and police work and all that kind of stuff. But yeah, the Vietnam ties seem very eighties. And the interesting thing is too, they both have this experience, this war experience dating back to Vietnam, although they're about 12 or 13 years apart in age, which is interesting. Roger says he was back serving in 65. And then Riggs says later on he was serving in 69 as a 19 year old. So you could kind of date him and figure out how old he is. You know, Roger's 50 when the movie starts and then you mm -hmm. know that Riggs is younger. But then if you do the math, you say, okay, put two and two together. Okay. He was 19 in 1969. So Riggs was born in 1950. Right. So then that would make them about 12 or 13 years apart, something like that, which is interesting. So Riggs would be about 37, 36, maybe turning 37 when this movie starts, which is interesting. And again, that age difference, the, the different level of energy, the different personality, personalities laid back and a little slower to the draw than Riggs, where Riggs is sort of always man on fire style and everything like that. Super, super fun. And, you know, that chemistry is so authentic between these two. And I think Richard Donner was even saying that when they did their first table read together to kind of see what kind of chemistry these guys could do and what, what they could pull off together, like it was instantaneous. Their chemistry, the way they were riffing and coming up with humor that wasn't even in the script and just the fact that they became friends on the spot, that's so identifiable in the film. It's so authentic. You could really mm. feel that they have a fast friendship and real love for each other. When those cameras shut off, that just it just continues, and that we just get to see it when they're rolling. It's kind of neat. You don't get to see that a lot, and I think when it's contrived and when it's put on for the film or the TV show, or whatever it is, 
I think that reads, you know, even if you can't articulate it, I think that reads. So the fact that these two are so good together, you know, that, that, that chemistry is automatic. So, so much fun, man. I think, and I think that's why we're still talking about this movie today, because how many buddy cop action flicks, thrillers, we have Die Hard, we have a a laundry list dating back to the seventies of buddy cop films. And this is always in in the top 10 and it's always going to be in the top 10. Well, I totally agree with that. I I guess we should go into this now then. Um, Brucey Thomas wrote in and said, Brothers Moriarty, got to ask a simple question. Mm. Where does this rank in your action movie pantheon? Mm. For me, it's number two right behind Die Hard. We'll talk about that in a minute. Mm -hmm. The buddy cop aspect, the psycho henchman, the awesome middle of the desert trade scene. This movie rules. I don't know. It's like there are so many action films that are so good, even ones that both of these people have done, especially Mel Gibson. Mel Gibson did like a run of random action films in the 90s and 2000s, like like conspiracy theory and payback when he was the mm. bad guy i think in oh, that one payback. and and so i there's but when i think about movies like crime movies or whatever my my mind often comes to snatch oh so <laughs> like that's kind of where my mind goes when i think about ultimate crime movie but as far as buddy cop the only other ones that i would really consider is rush hour which i also love and i mean rush hour mm. is obviously based heavily on lethal weapon but is there any does anything come to you as far as the pantheon of action films? Where does this one stand? I know you love Lethal Weapon 2 as well. Oh, it's uh, so good. Yeah. And 3 and 4. And you know, yeah, the way like they grow too. the fr- They're yeah. so good. And yeah. we'll, we'll talk about all of them at some point. But yeah, you do. I For me, I always come back to Lethal Weapon because it's just so much fun. I think it was also sort of ingrained in our minds because Lethal Weapon and Lethal Weapon 2 specifically in the 80s and 90s were played a lot on television, movie of the week, network mm-hmm. style, not even the cable channels. So they were sort of filtered for content and shortened versions. And of course you had to deal with commercials, but they were on and on and on summer movies and all this kind of stuff. Tangle and Cash was one of those two, which I have fond memories of because it was on television so much. And But as far as comedic action, buddy cop films, I, I definitely don't put anything higher than the Lethal Weapon franchise. But I love buddy cop formula in general. Colin brought up British crime flicks, Snatch, Lock, Stock. You think of Long Good Friday and Get Carter and Gangster Number One and Hard Men and Sexy Beast and all these British gangster films are kind of a world apart. I I, I just love them so much. That's a whole nother genre. Yeah, shout out, Guy Ritchie. We love you. Oh, I, I love him so much. I love his whole style. And then, of course, you have the sci-fi thing with Men in Black sort of change up the equation a little bit. And then the more serious stuff that we talked about, like the French connection, but just having the, just having the action thing with the buddy cop, two disparate personalities. I would put Mississippi burning in the same category with the flow and Gene Hackman, you know, but when you bring the humor in true detective, true detective Riggs and Marty and and Rustin Cole, Mm -hmm. it's two of the best ever. And there's a little humor and levity in that too. But when you bring the humor in and you set the tone a certain way, like they do with Lethal Weapon, and by the way, they do it very early on in the film. You have this crazy thing going on, this flyby of LA, lands on this woman, in this penthouse apartment, this young girl, porn star, half naked, fondling herself, doing coke, commits suicide. Yeah, I don't suicide. remember the, any of this. I'll talk about that in a minute, but this was it like- gets, I was like It's heavy from the beginning, right? Yeah. But yeah. you, it establishes a tone very early because there's no gore, there's no blood. You see the dead young girl laying on top of the smashed car. You know very early on the rules are being set. There's not going to be an excess amount of visual gore or uh, it's not going to get too bloody. It's not going to get too crazy. There's always going to be a little bit of drama, but it's always going to be diluted with a little levity. And that that only becomes more pronounced as the franchise goes on. But they do set the rules. Donner and, and cast and crew do set the rules very early. And I think... That's why I really find it fun at the end of the day because it doesn't, it only goes so far into drama. It never crosses into melodrama or something that's unpleasant. You know, it maintains that tone that I always go in for. And I think that's why I love it so much. Yeah, well said. As far as the TV connection is concerned, I do want to read about this from David Wilson. He wrote in and said, Super Moriarty Bros. Lethal Weapon harkens back to simple times for me. I know you recently discussed watching movies on TV and during commercials every few minutes. 
That's how I was introduced to the Lethal Weapon series. It wasn't until I was older that I realized how much movies like this were edited for TV. Oh. And watching movies like this, how important is it to experience them unedited or are the TV versions fine? I'm getting too old for this shit. Thank you, David, for writing in. Um, <laughs> I, I was thinking about that, too, because I don't know when I first saw Lethal Weapon. And I'm wondering if it was just because I saw it on TV so much that I didn't remember so many of the breasts and the coke and all yeah. these things. Like there's a, quite a bit. It earns its rating here quite a bit. But it is one of those movies in that pantheon, as you said. I had to shout that out because it is true. Um, I want to bring up uh, Die Hard again because I, I promised I would. Stu Hall wrote in about this because I thought about this the same exact thing when I was watching it. He said, if Die Hard counts as a Christmas film, then why isn't this talked about in the same breath? Mm. It's completely true. I, I don't Absolutely. know that I ever made the connection but because Die Hard, that's always been the joke that it's a Christmas movie. But this is just as much of a Christmas movie as Die Hard is, if not more in some ways, Maybe because more, I think that yeah. it's the holiday season that kind of brings on that extra suicidal sadness in in um, Riggs's life. And good point. Yeah. You know, Murtaugh being very f- with his family, the Christmas scenery, the dinner at the end, the tree in the window that's destroyed all the red. Like, is, there's a lot of. It is a Christmas movie. I, I just and it's it was I was looking to make sure I was like, when did this come out? It came out in March. Of 1987, yeah. so it's an interesting choice. Is Lethal Weapon a Christmas movie? It really is. It's a Christmas movie from start to front. You know, from front to back, from start to end, it's a Christmas movie. And I didn't remember that. It's, I mean, it's Christmas themed throughout. I mean, it opens with Jingle Bell Rock over the opening scene, this opening montage. And then there's, you know, there's a scene in the Christmas tree farm. There's Roger's house. There's Christmas decorations in town. Everybody, they're singing Christmas carols at the police station. I mean, from A to Z, it's a Christmas film and it never gets credit for that. It's very strange. I, I didn't remember it either. I'm just as guilty as anybody else. Yeah, it's funny. It, 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 it is very much imbued with that. And I wonder, I mean, that's fine for the decision making. It seems weird to have released it in March because of that. But that they that's did very they did. strange timing. Yeah. yeah. Well. It still worked. They made, what, six times more money than they, they spent creating it. For sure. I want to ask you about the... There's just a few things I wanted to ask you about. One of the things I wanted to bring up was, am I the only person that thought it was weird, the whole scene in the bathtub in the beginning of the movie? <laughs> the, the, this grown 50-year-old man. First of all, cool-ass bathroom with those light brown tiles. Oh, Very so easy. Love it. Oh, love, love it. it. Love it. But he's in the bath, and his family just all comes in. And gives him a cake or something and celebrates. It's like, I'm like, this is very weird. Did you find that weird as well? It's unsettling. It's almost one of those things where how did no one watching this or, or even if you didn't realize how weird it was when you were filming it, when you were cutting it together and editing it, someone was like, this is a little weird. It's not maybe, we should, maybe we don't need this scene or we should, you know, have a pickup or something like that. What did that stick out to you at all? Or is that just me? Absolutely. I mean, now I'm thinking back too. Was it? E- it wasn't even a bubble bath, was it? I'm not even sure if there was bubbles in that bath. Well, there. Like, Michael pointed out there, like there are like scant bubbles, not enough to cover this man's jump. They filmed sure. so many takes that the bubbles are all but completely. Probably, depleted, yeah, probably, right? yeah. And I think someone pointed out to me that the little the son's shirt is already wet from previous takes because you know Roger playfully pulls him mm-hmm. into the tub a little bit, which is really funny. But I mean, I love the lightheartedness of it. And I love the fact, okay, exposition, we got to say, here's a 20 year police detective veteran. He's turning 50. How do we put this in? How do we show, not tell, put it into the script? But this is a really funny choice to put, you know, the wife and the three kids, one grown kid, she must be what, 16, 17, into the bathroom with the dad who's taking a bath in broad daylight, by the way, which is, I think, daytime. The daytime bath thing's a little strange as well. Yeah, I thought that too. I'm like, you're 50 years old. Are you taking a bath? Is this like what you do <laughs> in the morning? Because I like baths. I, I mean, no disrespect. I like baths, but... I'll let you know this- in two years if I start if I start doing... That's another thing. It's like, I was so young when I first saw this. Now I'm almost as old as Roger. Dude, just shoot me. I was... I actually, it was just Dana's birthday, and I was saying next year... You turn 50. We have to do something to commemorate this event. That's right. Next year. Oh, my God. Mm -hmm. I'm 48, by the way. I'm not 49 yet. But Colin's right. Next year, technically, I do turn. Oh, my God. Yeah, December of 2023. And David just turned 53. Yeah, right. (laughs) Yeah, close. (laughs) Close. I'm looking at uh, Tracy Wolf, who is the person that plays Rianne Murtaugh. I Mm. thought she looked familiar, but I didn't know this. She plays Rianne in... And that's basically all she's ever done. 
for the most yeah, part. Yeah, she's done like a, a two episode stint on Cosby, I think. And that's it. So that's, she's, I wonder- she's quiet. She was really cute too. Like I remember even as a kid being like, oh, she's really adorable. Definitely. Definitely. What, what did you make of the whole family angle with Myrtle? I really liked that. Like getting, they really integrate. It's very much yin, yin, yin and yang because you have this loss, this, this guy living in a rundown motor home doesn't give a fuck about anything. And then you have, and, and the loss of family and the, and the possibility of that. And then you have this very robust nuclear family. Um, and Mike and I were talking about it a little bit too, that it's it's from that era, not that it's always been really, but it's from that era where I feel like filmmakers and TV creators and all this were very honed in on black nuclear families and showing that. And so it's cool because it, it brings in that extra oomph, like what, what Riggs is fighting for inside was the possibility of what Murtaugh already has and defends. And I think that brings in Riggs as someone who wants to help defend that mm. on behalf of someone he comes to care about. So I, I like that. And also I wanted to ask you, what did you make of showing? Because I thought this was a very weird choice, showing the house being kind of like under construction or renovation, I, I, like the kitchen. What did you think about that? That has to be some sort of intentional thing. Like that there's they're, a film they could easily hire their teamsters to fix this set right. or fix this house if they want to. So what did you think about their whole setting with the, the Murtaugh's and their house and the family? That kitchen renovation thing where you see kind of the drywall and you see the back of all the stuff in the kitchen because there's no there's no separating wall there. It's never discussed as far as I know. I watched it twice. They never talk about it. It's just happening. And it's interesting how it plays into part two as well because if you remember, we'll talk about this film in the future, but he's getting the garage, he's getting an addition put above the garage but they actually play that into the storyline with the guy, the carpenter up there with the nail gun and he scares Martin and Riggs draw their gun on him and on the on the worker and all this kind of stuff. And I think later on it plays into the ending with the the final fight with the bad guys in that film. But it is an interesting choice. I think there's something here. First of all, I love the integration of the Murtaugh family. It's a lot, it's a lot of fun. It's you hear you have this successful professional. He's aging, just turned 50. Black Balloon is 40, right? I don't know what 50 is. But I like the fact that the, you know, usually in a in a formula like this, in a film, it's an afterthought, or the family's a hindrance to the profession or getting in the way or just annoying. But Roger really loves his family. He's got and the family has texture. You know, they're not a perfect family. The wife is warm and loving and a good mom, but she can't cook. You know, it gives you details. You know, the younger, the, he, Roger's dealing with his his oldest. You know, she's getting older. She's, you know, doing pot and she's re- wearing revealing prom dresses. And then the two younger kids are kind of a scutch and they're they're being a pain in the ass at the dinner table. But you know, there's a love, and even the the cat, right? Uh, Gle- what is it, Burbank the cat? Yeah, Burbank even in there. Yeah. It gives some detail to the family, makes it believable, and also by proxy, Definitely. Riggs is getting pulled into Murtaugh's family. He's becoming not just a part of Murtaugh's sphere, but Murtaugh's family. You know, he's becoming part of the family. He's becoming like an uncle and a beloved uncle, and it's you see that really happening in part two, but you already see. That's happening. It's already in the offing that Riggs is becoming part of the Murtaugh family, which is so fun. And when you give the family a little dimension like they do in this, not too much, but we get enough that it feels substantial, then he's getting into, he's welcomed into this very appealing, very colorful family that's, uh, you know, kind of authentic in a way, feels real. And the thing about the house I always thought about with Murtaugh is that, you know, he's an older cop now, he's making some bread. He's got the boat. He's got the nice house. He's redoing. He's he's working on the inside of the home. He's renovating. It always felt to me like Murtaugh, and this goes on in the franchise too. Like Murtaugh is at that point in his life where he's just trying to again like enjoy the fruits of his labor. He wants to have a beer and sit in his boat and totally fuck around with the boat's engine and the talk about fishing. And I'm surprised golf doesn't come into it. You know, he's at that point in his career. Now he's dealing with this. Now he's dealing with this new injection of, I guess, chaos in rigs. And that just, it's aggravating for him. <laughs> totally. I, I Also, two things. I love 
we were laughing when we were watching it over here. Just the constant dunking on his wife and the cooking, <laughs> just like murdering the wife. <laughs> and we were talking about how can anyone be that bad at cooking? I'm a good cook. Mike is a great cook. But how can you just do something for years and decades and just be like, I just can't cook a chicken. I just can't. It's intuitive like, after a fashion. Like, what are you, you know? dumb? It's, it's not like it, it, it is strange. Like I, She made a really good point, Michael, when we were watching it, because it's like, who can remain that? Like, who do you know that is a bad cook who cooks constantly anyway? It, it's just. And why it's would you put up point. with that at all? That's very strange. But I like that because I just like how they're both bodying her on it. Like both Migs and <laughs> or Riggs and Murtaugh are. <laughs> are uh bodying this woman and she says well, roger you're being an asshole we grew yeah. up with great cooking right? right right we had mom we had grandma we had granny many years ago poppy owned a catering business i mean we were kind of surrounded by good cooking and maybe that sort of bleeds through by osmosis but i do wonder about this sometimes kyle when i was coming up in my 20s uh, we had food network and I watched it religiously. It was a yeah. comforting thing for me. It was awesome. Shout out, to, shout out to early Alton Brown. Love that. Loved. Uh, oh, he's one of the best. What was that? Dude. Good Eats? Yeah, I loved that yeah. show. Yeah. Oh, it's a great show. Filmed great out of his show. house in, in in Georgia. Yeah. Anyway. Iron Chef and Emeril mm-hmm. and Bobby Flay. And we had the, the two fat women at one point. Oh, they you were know, great. Yeah. Until they were on PBS, died. not Food Network, I think. Maybe yeah. They, they, were they, they were on PBS, I think. And um, Ming Tsai was on PBS. And East Ming Tsai was another. Oh, East Meets West. Yeah. So good. So I don't know if that has a part to play in why I became a comp. I became competent in the kitchen. I could, I could stand to learn a lot, and I definitely go back to the old standbys. And I need to get a little more adventurous. But I do wonder about that. But it's a good point. Yeah, if you're spending so many, so you're a stay-at-home mom, you're spending a lot of time in the kitchen. You think you would improve over time? <laughs> it's all. It's it's so funny because it's like a roast. All right. So I, I consider myself a good cook. I'm not a good baker. I don't like exact things or whatever. But if you put a roast in front of me or you put a chicken in front of me or you put and you're like, just make this do something with this. Be like, OK, I mean, there's a million different things I can do. Figure with this it right out. Now. Yeah, it's like the, it, you don't. I think people that are it's, are intimidated by cooking overthink it. I'm not mm. a fine cuisine guy. When I get when I go to a really nice restaurant, I get something that I couldn't even imagine making. But when I make it things at home, I'm very much a meat and potatoes kind of guy. And that's sure that's easy stuff. Chicken cutlets, meatloaf, you know all these various things. I, I'm very lazy though now because I almost do none of the cooking. I used to do all the cooking when I lived on, on my own. So I'm, you know, but you got to work on your knife skills. You got to work on your, on your, on your pan skills. You got to have a good feel for meat and temperature and, and you have a good feel for your oven and, you know, you got to have a gas stove. You got to have all those things. You know, what's up with Mrs. Murtaugh? She made the bacon. Why is she dropping eggs on the floor? Yeah, she's dropping and bacon. The bacon was kind of fucked up. I mean, she was it fucked she up. She did the oven. I, I some people would like like Allie would like that bacon. I like that bacon, too. But it's like borderline carbonized because it was she put it on a, pan, a, a a tray, an oven, which is what we use at the deli. When you want to cook a shit ton of bacon, you really got to cook the bacon on the stovetop, you know, unless you're making a ton of it. If you're making a whole package of bacon, go ahead, put it in the oven. But bacon is best when you put it on the on the skillet, cook it, then you dump that oil out, but you leave it greased up. You put the okay. eggs on top of that. Oh, you're that talking like that. deli style now. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I like it. Dude, I just thought, backstory, she burnt the kitchen down. They don't talk about it. That's possible. This could be backstory. That's this possible. This could be filler. We got to get into the fan fiction. Now. <laughs> fan thick for lethal weapon. The lethal weapon fan fiction. You know it exists. <laughs> They, Neo JD wrote in about something I wanted to touch on, and it is true. He says, gun range, smiley faces. I just wanted this for the first time. I just watched this for the first time. While it was enjoyable, I got to ask, is the third act just too ridiculous? Mm. The desert meet up with the helicopter literally on top of the car. Joshua dragging the woman along for a bit while jacking her car. Multiple instances of rigs shooting at Joshua while pedestrians are out and arguably in the line of fire. Joshua crashing the fiery car into the streetlight, even though he's driving fine up until then. The grenades in McAllister's car going off and killing him. The cop car through Murtaugh's wall. And finally, a fight in the rain after they have Joshua in custody. <laughs> <laughs> what the fuck? I'm getting too old for this shit. Thank you, Neo JD, for writing in. The, the last act is crazy. It's nuts. It's, it's, it's funny. It's fun, but it is crazy. The, I actually laughed out loud when they're driving to the desert and the car just stops and Riggs just gets out of the car and starts fucking running as fast as he can into the desert. With like a sniper and rifle. he's running zigzag. Yeah. It's <laughs> classic Mel Gibson. Like, I love it. You know, I love it. 
there's there is a lot of and the helicopter thing is is funny what i thought was funny too is when the guy gets shot by the sniper um he the guy with the sniper rifles i got like this ridiculous sweater on and like it's just insanity i don't know it very <laughs> much turns into eggnog. right exactly it's awesome so it's good, good shit it reminded me a little bit of magnum pi at the end like the way it just kind Absolutely. of gets zany but Absolutely. it kind of worked i didn't really dislike it what did you think about the end of the film and and we haven't talked about Mr. Joshua yet. Yeah, you got to talk about about that as well. Oh, so I can't wait. Take, take it away. I mean, yeah, the ending, the last act goes from zero to 60 in about no frames. I mean, in, <laughs> in one second. It's insane. It's almost like, and we talk about this sometimes, it almost feels like playing action figures with you when we were little. Like, right. we would just think of the most impossible scenario and do it. And then we had to escalate it from that impossible scenario. So, we would think of something even more insane. And it just kind of gravitated and evolved that way to it was just totally ridiculous. And, you know, but I think there's an 80s formula that you have to do. Like, there's so many 80s TV and film action rules. Like, you have to have the convoy in the desert with two limos and a helicopter. You had to have it. Magnum PI is the, is the perfect reference point. You know, like, that was old, or Airwolf or Knight Rider. Right. It was right, always... Exactly. Right. There was always like the badass truck or SUV or fighter jet or gunship or helicopter, whatever. And yeah, the action just gets more and more crazy. You know, it involves torture and involves shotguns and sniper rifles and hostages and, you know, bad, unrelenting bad guys and pure evil and escapes. They just had everything in that. The last act of this movie has everything. I mean, it literally it doesn't have any wild animals. I think that's the only thing it's missing. There's actually the source. Yeah, I was thinking maybe I'm getting it. Yeah, you're right. I was going to say, was there a dog somewhere? Mm. Uh, there's a dog in the end, I guess. There's a dog companion, but I, I, I oh, don't Riggs's dog. It. Right. But I don't yeah. think there's any. It's funny, man. Like there is one scene I wanted to ask you about in that desert scene that actually made me laugh out loud, too. When Murtaugh is threatening them with the hand grenade, <laughs> I was like. I, I I wanted to be like, is anyone here? Do you? I think you guys are vastly overestimating what this the damage this thing is going to do. These are like, special forces guys. I know these are like straight up CIA ops, Vietnam. Like they were saying, they were talking about how they were running the war out of Laos and doing all this kind of shit. And and then he comes and confronts them with a grenade. And there's a they're probably like twenty five feet away from him. Right? I would have been like, do whatever you want. Go ahead. Go ahead. Fucking let it uh, pull the pin. The shrapnel is not even going to reach us. I know. It's like, we'll just crouch behind the car at the very best. <laughs> I just didn't understand that. And then I don't know if that stood out to you, too. I just thought that was so funny. He's like, I got a grenade. It's like, who gives a shit? We're in the middle of the desert. We're not in like a small 12 by 12 room. <laughs> it's so funny, dude. I mean, you have to pull out the dad desperation thing, I guess. What else could they do? But. Yeah, it was. It's absolutely ridiculous. It's a cartoon, but that's why. That's why you get. That's you're in. You know, you're just cramming popcorn into your mouth at that point, grinning from ear to ear. Who cares? Doesn't and the matter. helicopter just touching on on the the top of the limo? She's like <laughs> trying to get away. It's so funny, man. It's so funny. And and just the really, what I was surprised about with uh, Gary Busey was just kind of a subdued, normal, yeah. not really even a really good performance. It was just like he just kind of was there. It's funny in hindsight to think that they didn't leverage Gary Busey, but it wasn't. I almost wonder if we would even care about Gary Busey today if he didn't get hurt. Not because we would have wanted that to happen, but it really altered Gary Busey into yeah. Gary Busey. Yes. Back then, I think he was trying to be more of like a serious actor, like just doing whatever roles presented and trying to do the best work he can. But I do love the torture scene. Because who the hell is that guy? Did they bring him back from Vietnam? Like I, I was wondering because because he's like he's Asian, I think, right? So he is I was like, I was like, sort, they, yeah. is he like involved? Uh, he he was like he has an accent, I think. So I'm like, he's not like an American Asian. So did they bring him back? Is he like a master torturer that they extracted from the Viet Cong or something? I don't understand. It's really fun. It's funny stuff. Like it's and then I have to talk the fight at the end. Oh, dude, I was I I didn't remember that. And I think that if I did remember that, I probably didn't connect why that's so insane. I'm, I was wondering, like, what is going on here? Like, they would not even the LAPD would do this. You know, not, like, the LAPD is insane. And 
they would not just stand around 50 of them watching this guy fight, you know, fight a cop. <laughs> Martel's like, wait, we're going to let this play out. Yeah, it's like, what? <laughs> and he almost kills him. You know, and it's so strange. I thought that was such a strange ending. Why do you think they felt like they needed to ratchet it up? Why do you think it works, too? I feel like it's you expect something a little more subdued, like a little more cer- cerebral, maybe at the end. And what you get yeah. is something that's like the Avengers, basically, or something. You know, it's like, holy shit, what the hell happened? It's, so it's kind of cool. It all goes off, basically, which is nice. It's like it's a different feeling than when we did say No Country for Old Men a few weeks ago, which has kind of a consistent insanity throughout the entire story. This really peaks. I guess it's just to kind of put a cap on the third arc. I, I guess it really wouldn't be any more sophisticated than that. Yeah, it feels like an 80s thing. You're just trying to kind of cater to the lowest denominator. You know, no offense to anybody, but you're just doing a popcorn action movie that's really accessible to everybody. So you're abandoning all reason and just creating a cartoon, basically, which is interesting because Lethal Weapon, you know, you deal with the characters, the gravity of the situation. Mel Gibson's character struggling with the loss of his wife, the the serious drama, you know, the dead young girl and the grieving father who's imploring Murtaugh to, you know, take the case and all that kind of thing. So you have a lot of gravity, but then you have the cartooniness and they kind of just, they kind of just go all in for the cartooniness at the end, which is fine. It's a welcome thing. I get what they were doing with the Gary Busey character, with the Joshua character. They were kind of creating, think back to old video games, right? You had the shadow link, shadow the last boss is the is the shadow version, the evil version of the good guy. So you had the shadow Riggs character, right? Mm-hmm. Special forces, super adept at combat, hard to kill, all these type of things. So to have that kind of face off at the end is so interesting though, because you're kind of left wondering, did these guys ever know each other? Riggs is like, let's have the title fight. Like, how do they there's like a false familiarity there. Like how did they, they don't know each other. They don't know they're the, the light and dark versions of each other. So they just kind of force that situation again. It's like banging the action figures together. Totally. And letting this thing play out. The other thing is it is a very static bad guy, not just the Joshua character, but the general too. They feel very dull, very beige and a little vacant and a little static and a little quiet. You would expect something bigger and more vibrant and colorful or gaudy or garish, you know, have like the really over the top bad guys. This is a lethal weapon movie. And later on, they would do that in two with the South Africans. And eventually we get Jet Li in there and you would have more interesting baddies. But in this one, it felt like even the bad guys, even the antagonists were kind of afterthoughts. And that's probably the weak link in the whole thing is like, there's not, you don't really care about the bad guys. Right. You know no, I mean? like, that's exactly right. Not until that, uh, not until uh, young Murtaugh is kidnapped. Do you really, are you really invested in these guys at all? I totally agree. I'm looking now and it's you know, Peter McAllister, General Peter McAllister. <laughs> there is that funny scene. I think it's with him where Mr. Joshua is burning himself. And then, <laughs> and then Peter McAllister just walks up and he's like, go oh, have the doctor look at that. Or whatever. It's like, what the so hell is going on here? It's fucking so insane. Cr- it's like, what? It's great when you're beholden to no rules. It just feels like you can't make movies like this anymore. You know, it's just like, we're going to do whatever we want. There doesn't really have to be any continuity. We could just be re- as ridiculous as we want from scene to scene. You understand these guys are bad guys. That's all you really need to know as an audience. Enjoy. <laughs> you know, it's just detached from reason. But I think that's why we love it so much. It also, makes no me rules. Wo- it also makes me wonder what's what was left on the cutting room floor they, in, in the sense that they could have had like a Caddyshack kind of situation where they realized that the bad guys weren't interesting enough to really have on there, that the dynamic between the buddy cops is what really drives the, the movie. So they just didn't put very much in there. And so it doesn't even make any sense. Like, I don't know enough to know what they cut out. For all we know, they cut out 20 minutes of the bad guys. And. They and there is like a they, director's cut. Yeah, there is, which I don't think I, is the one I watched. So just play up, make an origin in there. Like, you know, Mel Gibson was in the same Green Beret regiment platoon or whatever division as Joshua. And 
they were doing some heinous shit over there. So Mel Gibson got out. So there's already bad blood brewing this jet, you know, and Joshua was doing it on this general's order. So when they come back to the States and continue this heroin trade, then Mel Gibson already has a bone to pick. Right. You know, you just super simple and it doesn't seem like it would have been that hard, but I like that. Just, I, I think I like that abandoned just as much. You know what I mean? Just to say like, fuck it. It doesn't matter. Like, you know, there's something fun in that. I agree. Where the bad guy doesn't have to, who cares? It's a bad guy. <laughs> well, I think it, I, I don't know for sure. Cause I haven't seen the new Top Gun, but I believe in the new Top Gun that you don't even know who the bad guy is. Like it never, oh, it's never clear I was wondering at all. about this. And I think that's super cool in the sense that that's probably a protective thing because we all know who it would be in this situation yes. and they cannot say that because of, right. they want to sell the movie. But also, <laughs> good point. But also, I think it's cool to say like, it doesn't really matter. And it would be interesting to, I don't know if you could make a buddy cop film like that because it's not geopolitics. It's much more personal and you kind of need someone central to that. But it would have been cool for them mm. to say, no, it's just like a drug running operation. And there's an insinuation that the drug running operation is so mighty and so insurmountably big that they couldn't do anything about it anyway. So what would be interesting is if they were just dealing with a part of it without any ability to actually stop it from happening. Mm. And so it wouldn't really even be important or that would be in a future film or something like that. I don't know. Sure. I, I, I guess you yeah, could have yeah. done that, but you're right in the sense that it just doesn't matter. And it feels very eighties in that sense where it's kinetic and quick and explosive. It is funny. I mean, I love what he wrote in about just all the crazy shit that happens in the last 30 minutes of the movie. It's, but it's fun and it makes sense. And I guess you're anticipating it since there's so little action elsewhere. Or there's little scattered pieces of action. I guess you're kind of waiting for that payoff. David wrote in. I actually don't have experience with this, but I think you might. He says, did mm. you ever play Lethal Weapon on the NES? My friend had this game and she loved it. There were even two voice samples when you selected the characters of Murtaugh and Riggs. I'm too old for this. And hey, Mo probably took up 90 <laughs> percent of the of the uh, ROM space. Did you ever play that game? I actually didn't remember. I don't remember it. I looked up an NES long play of it. It looks horrible. It's like uh, a beat. It's like a beat em up. Yeah. But Side scrolling beat em up, right? Yeah. yeah. And you could switch off between Murtaugh and Riggs, if I remember. Correctly. Yeah. You like scroll off the screen and the other one comes on. Or and something. the other one comes on. So you right. can play as both. Yeah, it was really bad. I remember the AVGN episode, actually. It's funny, though. I'm looking. I don't have that game. I have to buy that. I have to. That's one I have to add to the uh, collection. That's a must have. I forgot all about that. Yeah, I wonder what it's. Uh, let's see, uh, lethal What's it weapon. Going for on the Ebs, NES, eBay, um, eBay, sixty five dollars loose. Is that true? really? Yeah, it must be rare. Is that an acclaim game or is that no? Uh, this is. I can't see the screens here. Why can't I? See? Oh, Ocean. Oh yeah, they had some movie games. Yeah, Ocean and it's too. funny because the box art is actually the second game I think because Danny DeVito is or not Danny DeVito, Joe Pesci is on it in the ba in the background. Um, you know, and he isn't isn't he the guy with the, the yeah Leo the Gets hair? yeah right right yeah. So he's on the cover of the Lethal Weapon One game. Oh, that's interesting because it was probably released around that time, eighty nine. Yeah, eighty nine was Lethal Weapon Two, right? Oh, that's interesting. Yeah, it had to be Ocean or LGN, LJN. Uh. Yeah. So I, I, I don't remember that game. I really don't, it's, which is weird because I remember most games, but I don't I don't remember that one at all. And yeah, I don't remember playing that with you. Yeah, I wonder what it, I wonder what in the uh, in the book that you worked on with um, Pat Country. I wonder. What, oh, I wonder what, what, what kind of regard there. this game. Is held <laughs> That'll in. be interesting to find out. I could see that as being one of those frustrates frustrating rentals you know back in 89 like you get it on a Friday night and you're stuck with it for three yeah. days oh yeah it like, sucked. Oh, I'm sure it sucked yeah but <laughs> never encountered that one all right dig is there anything that we haven't talked about that you would like to discuss about lethal weapon one you know what I found out that along with another gentleman gentleman's name who I'm forgetting Eric Clapton did the movie the music for this movie oh yeah that was in the beginning uh, you're right I noticed that in the beginning it it, it it was yeah let me I can look up who yeah he was. might be pre-opening right he's in the credits yeah. his name My, is yeah no credits. it is it's in the beginning Michael Kamen or Kamen and yeah and Eric, Eric Clapton. Clapton yeah that is strange I noticed that I forgot to write that in my notes that uh, was really an interesting thing for me it was like and I think the idea behind that was the sax, that heavy sax, right? 80 sax was sort of Murtaugh's thing. And then the guitar stings would come on for the rigs moments, which may, you know, which makes sense. And you know what this reminded me of? That sax, that this very specific 1987 Lethal Weapon soundtrack reminded me so much of Snatcher. 
if you guys have played Snatcher for the Sega CD, what other consoles was that on? Uh, maybe Saturn. I don't think it was. Maybe on Saturn. Yeah, Hide- Snatcher. Hideo Kojima's Snatcher borrows so much from Lethal Weapon, but especially the soundtrack. Yeah, I mean, it was it's on- like note for note. Saturn and PS1 only in Japan. Oh, PS1. That's right. Yeah, dude, that was just my. And you know what? The other thing was that opening scene with the young porn star girl and the nudity and stuff. Just re- it just really brought me back to 1987, 14 year old, 13, 14 year old Dagan and the sort of magnetism of that giant R, that rated R. When we're going to see movies now for the first time by ourselves without our parents. And this was one of those ones. I think of the Steven Seagal movies of this era. You know, the Spike Lee joints, all that kind of stuff. Mm-hmm. That rated R was a big thing. We would go in for that because we weren't used to having that kind of freedom back then. It was like totally. we could go see something without mom and dad, not worry about them walking into the living room. We could see a little nudity, a little violence, horror, whatever it was. That was a big part of growing up with movies like this. And But it's funny. I, I wish that I saw... I don't remember seeing Lethal Weapon 1. I do remember seeing Lethal Weapon 2 in the theater. And that's where my love affair with the franchise started. But dude, so, so much fun. I'm so happy that they... I'm really wondering if they could pull off a Lethal Weapon 5. Yes, they have Mel Gibson at the helm. He'll also be starring in it. Of course, Danny Glover is going to be a big part of the equation. Did the Rene Russo character die in Lethal Weapon three was that three when she comes into it i don't know because they could bring her this. back they could bring pesci back right leo Getz could come back they could get um the police chief who i think is richard donner's cousin in real life they could get if they get this you know chris rock could come back so you know you could get a lot of you could really do something fun but i'm just wondering if you could pull it off in this day and age because lethal weapon four was late 90s yeah 98 i think and we haven't had something since. Yeah, I remember Dad so and I can seeing you that pull in the it off? Yeah, I, I think know. I think it was yeah, 87, 89, 92, 98, something like that. I think was okay. four movies. That sounds right. And yeah, I remember seeing correct. the fourth one with Dad in the theater. And I remember Dad being like reluctant for some reason. Not about the subject matter, because Dad showed me all sorts of heinous shit. I think I saw like <laughs> I think I saw Copland in the theater with Dad and shit like that. So but but that he was just didn't think it was gonna be good, and then I remember us really liking it. And uh, so because that, that was during the era when dad and I would just go to the movies all the time. I, I just saw everything in the fucking movies. So, yeah, he was a mark for Mel Gibson, too. He took me to see Payback when it came out. And I know that was channeling just growing up with lethal weapon movies, maybe Braveheart, too. Yeah, dad, dad loves that shit, man. I mean, he loves Seagal and he loves all that. All those movies. Yeah. No one loves those movies more than dad. So he really we have to get to see how we've not done anything with Steven Seagal. Yeah, like that's an, almost incredible. He's a legend. Steven Seagal oh my is legendary. And what's so legendary about him is that dad wanted to be Steven Seagal. And I don't oh. care what he says. <laughs> I know. Yeah, it. because there was a moment in time where now Steven Seagal is corny, right? And he's right. played he's, out. He's but fat and like, yeah, he's like, He was kind of, he was right up there kind of with Bruce Willis and Mel Gibson as far as like action stars who women wanted and men wanted to be totally yeah right? so dad definitely like because because remember he would his a lot of his roles he was like naturalist and into kung fu and absolutely very quiet soft spoken and just kind of like and you know that dad was like i want to be this man tai like, chi chi kung right like centered. he would just he would just come in and like Pah! you know like fucking murder <laughs> someone you know cry chop him <laughs> in the neck without and i was just and i it's like dad, that's why dad dr- dragged me to all these movies when i was a kid because he loved Steven Seagal and he had no problem with me watching any of those movies. And and they, a lot of them, I don't want to say a lot of them, but there were some that were really good. Oh uh, dude. They're so- I want to go back and re, re, re experience like under siege and all these other things and see, like, I, f- I feel like these movies are good. Out yeah. for justice, marked for death, cartoon, live action cartoons. Talk about like, yeah, the super ridiculous bad guys, the scenarios, just, just the a- damsel in distress. Like it just, it didn't give a shit. It just, it was pure trope. And unapologetically so. I'm just a cook is like a line you and I would say uh, all the time. (laughs) I'm just a cook. (laughs) I'm just a cook. After you just like slit some dude's throat (laughs) with like a thrown (laughs) dagger or something like that. Who are you? (laughs) After the guy's both the forearms are snapped in half. Who are you? (laughs) Just a cook. (laughs) (laughs) And you know they got like 30 takes of that too. I would love to see the real. Why is it important to know who the person is? After like, 
I it's like know. go get medical attention. Who gives I know, a you, shit? <laughs> yeah, it's like very um very comic book. It's like you know, I'm <laughs> so telling them it was the Riddler or whatever. You know, <laughs> who are you? <laughs> we gotta get. I gotta get Steven Seagal on the on the list. That I don't know what I'm writing that down. I that'd don't know be, what that would uh, be amazing. I I think that's true. I think yeah. I'm wondering like is that one of the ones that we do two or three movies at a time? But I don't think so. I think you could mine that for content all oh, day. Oh yeah, years for years. Any we one can do Steven movie. Seagal for ten years. We can we can cover <laughs> Steven Seagal movies because it is funny. Like I love watching his his fat era now that he's like you know he's overweight and he does his like but he still wears the gi. And he still does oh, like performances, God. especially in Russia, where people like let them beat him. You know, he let like let him win. <laughs> I don't know what the fuck is going on with all that, but didn't he go him. on Saturday Night Live and then he wouldn't do any of the things they wanted him to do? I don't know. Like, if they know anything week, about that. That's awesome. And then the performance was like a, a travesty. Like it was. There's something that happened there where he just <laughs> would not play along with anything. Like he. <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome we got to look into it because he's 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 so great i feel like younger people that listen to the show kind of missed him and yes. i would say even i was a little young for steven seagal I mean, you he are was, he was kind of when i was a teenager he was kind of in his b movie phase but yes and maybe he was always in that phase in some way but there, like dagan said there were some big ones there oh and, they were yeah. big budget films they yeah. were with big cinematic runs and they made a lot of profit. You you were on the young end. If you didn't have dad, you probably wouldn't have been exposed as you were. <laughs> yeah. To the oh. mighty. <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> all right, my friend. Well, that's all we have to say about the 1987 Mel Gibson and Danny Glover film, Lethal Weapon, a classic. We'll get to Lethal Weapon 2 in, in short order. Really wonderful to revisit this film again. You can check it out. I looked around where I could find it. In fact, I was mad because... I Googled, where is Lethal Weapon streaming? And then it was like Hulu. And I was like, oh, okay. And then I went on Hulu and it was the Lethal Weapon TV show. Yes. And I'm like, you thing. damn well know that, that that wasn't what I meant. I didn't even know that existed, by the way. I forgot it existed. Or like no I idea. thought it was canceled or something. But I, I was just mad because I'm like, you know, that's not what I meant. Like, you know, <laughs> that that's not what I meant. So then I had to go and look and lo and behold, it was on like Peacock, which I don't have. So I, I had to go and and it's on HBO, I think, too. But I canceled that. So no, they got, it was on HBO for years, the entire franchise, and they just dumped it. In August. Oh, bummer. Bummer. So yeah. I think Pe- I think Peacock might be where it is. But anyway, I rented it on Amazon, which Me is too, so same. easy. It's like, who cares? Four dollars. Just do it. I was get getting so annoyed. Like, they tell you all kinds of funny shit on there. Yeah, it's it's I love Amazon. Big fan. Of Amazon I'm a Prime. fan too of Prime. I, just I like because it. it's like they probably don't have it streaming, but you can just rent it. Who cares? It's it's really not. And I was thinking about it Old too. School. I was like four bucks. I know you only get to keep it for 24 or 48 hours. I'm only going to watch yeah. it once. I'm not fucking psychotic, but <laughs> it's like we used to rent movies for four dollars back in the day. That's what it four is. Four, five, six dollars. So it's, it's the old school model. It's, it's very cheap, all things considered. You know, good four dollars can't buy anything anymore. You know, no, buy with four, literally you know, buy with four dollars. A subscription to this that. last damn media. Well, you're almost there. Four dollars. Hey, there you go. You can actually do it for a dollar if you want. Anyway, Dave, appreciate your time. Let's end fun. this episode of Knockback as we always do with a dad joke. Oh, I got a special one for us today, Kyle. This dad joke coming from somebody very special in our lives. Now, I'm going to read you the dad joke, and then I want you to tell me who sent me this dad joke. Okay? Hmm. See if you could guess. Kyle, Bigfoot is sometimes confused with Sasquatch. Yeti never complains. <laughs> <laughs> hmm. Who sent me this dad joke? First time dad joke contributor, I think, for Knockback. I don't know. Dana? No. I haven't, we haven't had one from Dana yet, no. have we? No. She subtly listens to the show, I think, though. So. Dane, send me the knock. Send, send me who, the joke. Who, who is it? Tell me. This is from Mom. Mom? Our mom, Betty Ann Moriarty. Wow. With the Bigfoot Sasquatch Yeti joke. I know. So Dagan refuses to use Discord, which is like the most frustrating thing in the world. (laughs) But there's a memes channel in our Discord. We have over 5,000 people in our Discord for Last Stand Media. Wow, that's a lot. um, Yeah, yeah. Our our Discord is is hopping. Big community. it's, It's one of your perks for being on Patreon. And so we have a whole memes channel there. That's where I live. I live in the memes channel. And the we have a bunch of different emoji type reactions that we have on our server and there's a Dagan face reaction like a da- like your face when it's a dad joke meme oh nice yeah 
But you'll never know that because you won't go on Discord. I've been on there once. But one day, uh, several times over the course of one day, then I kind of gave up again. People make fun of me because I use a browser to, to use Discord. A lot of people, and I use an app on my phone, but you can have an app on your computer. It's literally just a chat room that you leave in a browser. Oh, you yeah. could put the app on your machine. It doesn't have yeah, to be like I have phone. it open right now on on um, Chrome. Like right, I'm looking oh, at it okay. right now. That's yeah. easy. Even I could do that. So it's like just one awesome. of my many windows that I have or one of my many tabs. You know, I have I Patreon gotcha. and I have Twitter and then there's just the Discord tab. I got gotcha. you. Okay. But that's that kind of the weird way to use it. There is an app like a Spotify type app that you use on your computer. I use that type app on my phone, but we would love to see everyone over there. It's fun. We, we talk about all, all manner of things. People really annoy the shit out of me and I get mad at them. <laughs> if they can't get your goat, then what's it all worth? They all know exactly how to get my goat. There's the um, we have one of the emojis we have, you know, the Wojak emoji, like the face, the the, the f- smiling face, the crying oh, sure. face. Yeah, like yeah, that, yeah of that course. Fucking hysterical. Telly. Yeah. It's so, it's so there's a PlayStation one where there's like a, a hat on backwards with a PlayStation logo and he's crying and they always react. They always react to my things with that. When I, That's when I, awesome. yeah. So they know how to bust my balls. Nice. You're an open book, my friend. All right, my friend. Appreciate you. Appreciate all of you out there for your love, kindness, and support. We also appreciate Steven Seagal. We'll get to you, my friend. Oh. In short no order. No one's safe. Not even him. All right. In the meantime, be well out there, Dagan. Thank you again. Oh, Thank laststandmedia.store for merch, of course. Get your uh, knockback merch. Your shirts. Please do. We sell a lot of sacred symbols merch. That's the most merch we sell. Always love you. Know, Micah goes upstairs with a stack of shirts that she like put, you know, packs away every day. To Is send this a out. daily thing? She's doing it. Yeah. Every day. Yeah. Wow. And, and um, we, she sends them like three or four times a week, but she's always packing them. Just setting Holy them up. Shit. That's and I love seeing the green shirts in that stack. You know, oh, the green shirts peppered in there. Thank you for that support. Yeah. Dagan, Dagan can't eat without this show. You better. You fill me up. <sighs> oh, literally. Yeah. Look at that. Stop it. <laughs> you were being a little perverse, by the way, at the beginning of the show, too. I felt you were saying a lot of things about, about bur- bur- busting or something. I don't know what you were saying at the beginning. I'm like, I don't know. It's a lot. Of, where's your mind at? All right. Let's get that ladder. I don't even know what I'm talking about. We'll see you next time. Until then, <laughs> goodbye. Knockback, a retro and nostalgia podcast, is a product and trademark of Last Stand Media and Collins Last Stand LLC and is recorded from Central Virginia and the Philadelphia suburbs, USA. The show was conceived by and is produced by me, Colin Moriarty. My co-host is Dagan Moriarty. Knockback's executive producer is Dustin Furman, and the show is edited by associate producer Ben Smith. As you know, all of Last Stand Media's shows, including Knockback, are fan-funded on Patreon at patreon.com slash laststandmedia. The following names are at the producer support level or higher on Patreon, and we're grateful for your kindness and generosity. 